So welcome today. Um, you might remember in our first lockdown, we um, had some midweek conversations and I chatted to people from Emmanuel Church about their life and about their journey of faith in, in some ways. Um, Lucy and I have been listening to John Bishop on, on, on through his podcasts where he's been um, sharing with various famous celebs um, an invitation to share three significant words that maybe help to describe who they are, their life, and um, uh, what motivates them, what, what what sort of resonates with them. And I thought, oh, that's that's a good idea for a conversation. So I'm starting a new sort of series of conversations with people so that we can hear people's stories. And um, today I'd like to welcome John Eldred, who many of you know. Um, John's been around for a, a while, a long time, a lot longer than I have. Um, and um, I wondered, Jan, you know, that, that task of setting three words for you to use as a summary of your life, um, was, that, was that okay to do? Yeah, it was fine. To, what was difficult was to think, to separate out, are these words that describe a journey of faith or a journey of life? And to me, the two are inextricably bound up. So finding the words wasn't difficult. Okay, and uh, absolutely, because there, there is a, a sort of integration, I know, in your life of what you do um, work-wise and in terms of the community, and, and that sort of merges with what, what your faith is, the inspiration of your faith, and perhaps that's what it's like for a, a lot of us. Faith isn't categorised in a box, but seamlessly wefts its way through the... The material of our lives uh, a bit like um, a tapestry or, or something like that so so what I'm intrigued what's your, what's your first word first word is heritage excuse me heritage um history background who I am where I've come from and um whilst I think when you're young you often want to cast off that heritage to assert who you are independent of parents, grandparents, um, school education, you know, I am me, um, you realise as life goes by that those are very formative times. And uh, it's interesting because I've read sometimes on the messages on, on the Emmanuel Facebook, people revert, including you, Cameron, to, well, when I was young and when I was at school and when I was, and you realise how deep those things are and how they do shape you. And as life goes on and you begin to value and cherish those times and those people, um, then you begin to realise that they were part of for shaping who I am. And it's intriguing, isn't it? Because actually not only are we shaped by those gone before us, but you are shaping in your own way those who follow behind you. D did you ever feel that? Um, to a certain extent. Um, when you become an educator as a teacher, that is part of what you set out to do. You try to um, not so much shape. And in fact, I questioned the other day, somebody said, we're molding. And I said, no, I don't think we are. We're enabling, we're facilitating. But there is that influence. And as an educator, you hope that that's, that's what you end up doing, having some influence um, on people for good. Drawing yeah, so Sorry drawing out what is there in them and that's what education is about absolutely and certainly as a, a parent i think we've often felt this in either the part of our role is um providing a safe place where our children can be the people that they were meant to be not not clones of us not not a, a, an extension of the unfulfilled dreams of us but the people that they were created to be and i, and I guess that's part of what we would want to say in faith, isn't it? That we're all different, that we were created in, in the image of God, but all uniquely and, and allowing that uniqueness to shine is, is really important. And I know that, that from other conversations I've had with you, that that's part of what your faith would take you to, wouldn't it? In terms of respect for people. Absolutely. It, 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 the, the sense in which people have to be themselves rather than what they expect somebody else expects them to be, to be what somebody else wants them to be, expects them to be. And that's how I feel hugely for 
I mean, I think every generation gets that sense, young people get that sense of, well, are my clothes the right clothes? Am I, is my hair the right hair? Am I following the right kind of career or, or job? Or, and, and those sense in which you feel discomfort around it is not always permitted. So I think the more we can tell people that it, it, it's fine to be you and who you are and not shaped, but it takes a lot of guts, a lot of confidence, not to be kind of, not to follow the crowd. Mm. Um, so it's about empowering in a, in, a, in a very supportive kind of way, I think. Um, and so in terms of the word heritage, having come from a very strong Methodist context, my maternal grandparents, um, I often think, as I am a trustee of Emmanuel, my grandfather was a trustee of the old Pitt Street Church and so on. And um, that my grand maternal grandmother um, was chair of the Women's Bright Hour at a time when you'd realised how that was the beginning of women's emancipation. That was the place that women could speak. That was the women, women could take on responsibility. And all those sorts of things have informed my feminism, my independence, and so on. Um, so those are the things that shape you um, very strongly. And, and as I've got older, I feel them even more strongly. And what is it about, you know, Methodism in terms of its tradition, its heritage that you um, feel still speaks into today's world and today's society? What, what are those significant heritage places of Methodism that you you think are transferable whatever generation? I, I think it, one of the strong things for me was around the role of women uh, because of, of all the churches um, it has been not completely at the forefront but very much um, uh, in the avant-garde of saying women have a strong role to play in uh, in in the church um, and was ever thus in supportive roles but not necessarily in leadership roles. Um, and of course, we're still fighting some of those battles um, in, in the church wider and, and more widely and, and in, in life and, and as, as it is. Um, so I think some of those values around, around the roles and the valuing of every single person that they have something to contribute regardless of, of gender. Um, but also there's that strong sense of um, social justice. Mm, yeah that is um, embedded in what we do. And, you know, the Sunday school movement was education um, for everybody, not just those who could afford it. Um, and, um, and, and being married to a Quaker actually sort of enhances that sense of social justice and social action. So those are the, some of the lasting values. I mean, the, I guess around the gender thing is a political thing, but you know, I can't separate out politics and faith either. So, um, you know, that is that those things are married within me, as it were. Um, but I think activism within the Methodist Church is is something that I I, I hold dear, because I, I I am an I'm activist. Yeah, and I know that you are involved not only in the church, but yeah, it certainly. Um, in Barry's year's office of, of um, Sheriff of South Yorkshire, you, you took on a, a particular campaign in terms of homelessness. And I, I presume that that's emerging out of your dual sort of Quaker Methodist sort of linkage of, of justice, is that right? Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, homelessness is an issue dear to our hearts. and. Um, sort of the moment I'm working for the Open University and absolutely delighted to be working with a, a young woman who is doing a doctoral thesis on the links between adult literacy, my lifelong passion and discipline and homelessness. Um, so there are times when sort of the passions in your life come together in, 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 in a hugely rewarding way. But yeah, homelessness is something that is uh, really dear to our hearts. Uh, and of course, that ties in with my one of my other words. If I don't okay, let's go there now. Yeah, I suddenly about, thought that <laughs> about social action, uh, social justice. Actually, is 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 kind of the word, the, the two words, if I can be indulged, that come to mind. Um, but it's interesting that the homelessness um, passion and concern and we've continued to support and, and work particularly with crisis and Centrepoint here in Barnsley 
um, to advocate particularly and to fundraise for, for those charities, uh, was born out of another desire and passion around social justice, which was around the work with Habitat for Humanity. So we've spent decades working overseas in a voluntary capacity, giving up our holidays and so on, to volunteer to build homes in um, developing countries. And then thought, well, why aren't we doing the same thing on our own doorstep? So often what's under your nose you miss because you're, you're, you're looking far too far ahead. Um, so those things have been great synergies in our lives that we can work around with, with hab Habitat for Humanity um, overseas, but also around the homelessness agenda in, in, in our own town. And where does that inspiration come from in terms of um, you in, in, in a faith perspective, you know, working out your faith? Um, what, what is pr provoking you to take social justice so seriously? Um, love your neighbour and yourself. There are strong, strong themes both in the Old Testament and the New Testament about justice. God is, you know, the justice that flows like water. Um, and uh, yeah, just a strong sense of human response that if you see somebody who has not got those basics in life, where's the justice in that? Where is the fairness in that? How can we expect people to rise up and contribute if what they're doing is struggling to put food in their tummies and find a roof over their heads. Um, and it doesn't do any of us any, any good to ignore those things because my, my richness is predicated upon the poverty of others and that is totally unjust. So until we're all feeling that we are wealthy in whatever terms, I'm not talking materially here, but to have enough to have a roof over your head and, and food on the table and to have that sense of um, empowerment and, and dignity of life that you can contribute to a family, relationships and a community. That's what drives that sense of injustice and forms it into social justice social action that follows. Yeah, and I'm, I'm reminded that Jesus himself seemed to be a man of true integrity, um, um, coming face to face with injustice and speaking it out, which is yeah. often where the church is not that great, actually, um, speaking it out and then doing something practical about it. And you know, it's in Matthew, isn't it? Um, um, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you as a stranger? When did we see you naked and not do something? And Jesus says, unless you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. And, and that sense that Jesus commands us also to be people of social justice. And that was exactly the readings that we had at um, Barry's um, legal service when he was high sheriff. That was exactly that reading that, that, that one of them that we chose. Um, yeah, because it, Prayer is using two feet or two hands. It, it's an expression, it's action. Um, you know, words are, are, are wonderful, um, but only when they, they, they compel you and power you to do something. And yeah, you say, I, you know, I've been a bit disappointed during the lockdown. There's been a huge amount of work gone on by individuals from churches, organized by churches. But where are the big national leaders who are speaking out and saying, you know, this pandemic is, is also based on a lot of injustice um, and a lot of inequality. Um, and, you know, those voices need to be more strongly heard um, so that people do know what we stand for. And social justice, um, I guess, also, I'm just thinking about your life. Um, I know that you're also involved in the Citizens Advice Bureau, CAB. Um, is, is that another sort of practical expression of you wanting to bring about social justice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, it, it's interesting because it, you know you're, the twists and turns of life. The I trained as a primary school teacher, and as I had my children, um, this is going back a long, long time. You had no right to return to work. You 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 had in your notice, and that was it. Um, uh, but during that time, there was a national campaign um, about adult literacy. 
And so I thought, well, I'm a trained teacher. I, maybe I can volunteer. And uh, I never really went back into, into primary education after that. I was hooked. So I became a volunteer with an adult literacy scheme. And then that shaped the whole of my then future career. Um, and that um, was kind of what drove me. I, I, you know, teaching people, but also then doing lots of research, doing lots of advocacy, um, both nationally and globally in the end. Um, but it was that sense of there are these there are people in our community who are not empowered to engage and to have that richness of life and diversity that those of us who are who, who can manipulate words and, and understand words. Um, and, you know, we see this with the digital divide at the moment, but the digital divide is also predicated on, um, you know, linguistic and literacy divide too. So I'm still very passionate about that. But then as I was in retirement, somebody approached me and said, um, do you think you'd like to be on the board of the trustee board of the citizens advice? Well, nothing to do with me. I don't know anything about advice. And they said, no, you don't need to know about advice itself. Um, and the, then the strand of being able to inform and advise and guide people, the majority, not all, but many, many of whom have literacy difficulties, navigating their way around the complexity. I will say, I pay somebody to sort out my tax things and understand the, the intricacies of that special language. And yet we're very condemnatory of people who can't get to an arbitrary level grade C at GCSE. Um, and, and that determines their, their future lives and, 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 and how, how they are seen and how they see themselves. So citizen's advice kind of whilst it wasn't something that I thought, oh yeah, that's something I'd like to do, suddenly presents itself, a God-given moment, many might say, um, and I became a trustee and currently I've been the last five years I've been chair of the trustee board and I am I am just amazed at the work they do, um, the care, the compassion, but the professionalism, the detail, the data gathering, it appeals to all aspects of, of, of who I am. So that is that is social justice. So homelessness, sort of um, Habitat for Humanity, CAB, Fair Trade, I know you've been involved with, Peace Movement, a lot of the ramifications of faith um, spill out practically for you yep. in yeah. lots of different arenas. And, and it's not a, 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 a sort of faith there and all these issues there. It's, it's, it's a sort of bringing the two together. That's fascinating. Just tell me about your third word, Jan, because we've had okay. heritage and social justice. Right, the third um, word, love. Um, and I think when I, when I, it, the love was the word that immediately sprang to mind. And then I started to unpack, well, what do I mean by this? Um, and I think um, that all of my actions, all of my, um, that my life is based on a concept that I should love others as I feel that I love myself. Sometimes I don't love myself enough, so I don't love my neighbour enough either. Um, but it, Having left, when I left, we grew up, I grew up in Barnsley, having left Barnsley, gone to the swinging 60s in London, life was, uh, was never quite so uh, thrilling and exciting as it was then. Um, and, um, and then traveled around, we, we lived in, in, in South Wales and we lived in Kent, and then came back to Barnsley. And as, as kind of adulthood, you mature slightly, you start to think, well, where, where, where do I put my energies? What organization do I align with? And you look around, there is, I cannot think of any institution, organization, movement that is just about love. It's about love of the world in its, its creation. It's about the love of the people who are in that world. And that kind of seems to me the foundation, the rock of, of, of who I am and what I believe and that everybody deserves to be loved and to know what it is to love um, uh, life in all its fullness. And so that's kind of what keeps me, I think, within the church movement. 
I get really frustrated by it. I, I, I question and doubt a lot of the, the, the traditions and habits that we create. And yet I look around and I think, where else could I be as me? Um, encouraged, supported, challenged, um, because I think from question and doubt, you, you, you work things out. Um, irritated times and so on. But all of all the fundamental belief is that every one of us is loved and can give love. And that's, I think, brings together, it sits alongside the social justice agenda. But, but, but where else? Where else in the world is there another organization that would say, what's our number one tenet is, is about love. So that's why. And clearly you want to, then for church to be then a place where people can both love God and work out what it means to love everyone else. Exactly, yeah. 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 And mm. those two are wrapped up completely. You, you love, I mean, we are told, and I've said this several times in this conversation, um, you know, you love your neighbour as yourself. The first is to love God. However you conceive, perceive, understand, experience that word. Um, and for me, God and love are not quite synonymous, but our love is a huge part of what God means to me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's expressed in... In, in, in all sorts of all sorts of ways. Sometimes it's through anger, uh, because of injustice, and uh, um, and there are lots of times when I rant at the media and rant at the television and rant at the radio, um, because of I'm driven by love and care for 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 the people that I'm listening to or hearing about. Um, but yeah, so the institution, organisation, community, movement of, of of the church and and describes itself as the Christian movement is where I can find expression of, 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 that, of that word. And what would you say, you know, then um, um, should be the outward expression of um, the church's love to a world in need? How, how, how do we express that? Because it's very easy to have this notion of love but, you know, how do, how do people experience that? And well, I think we can do it in a tiny way. Um, and so lockdown and COVID-19 has offered us lots of tiny ways, but those tiny ways make a huge difference, whether that's picking up the phone to somebody, just dropping a card through or a little letter through um, a letterbox. And I know I have been a recipient of those things as well as a giver of those things. So when people say, well, you can't do great things and travel around the world and build houses for people. Um, you know, some of you are privileged to be able to do that. You know, there comes a time when all of us won't be able to physically. And there are some people who just cannot do it for all sorts of reasons. So I think some it's, it's those tiny, tiny steps. It's those incremental bits that all stack up that make a difference. It's about relationships. Um, it's about that conversation. And that's another thing that in this time, when you walk out in the street or you walk out in the countryside, people speak to you, they greet you. There, there's a permission to say a glorious day, you know, aren't we lucky to be out here or isn't it hard or, and these are strangers. And I think it's all those tiny incremental things that mean we can change the world. And um, yeah, another world is possible. But those little things all add up because it's those little things that stack up. Then people say, well, what about? And let's do. And the momentum grows like a snowball. Yeah, so uh, the expectation doesn't need to be large and grand and high profile. Actually, we can all express God's love through our love in very practical ways, very simple ways, as you've sort of very um, powerfully um, verbalised, um, you know, and that makes a difference. It, it makes a difference to other people and it makes them know that they are loved. And, and because we have been the recipients 
of God's love, then surely then it is bound in upon us to express that love in turn to all those whom we may meet. And it doesn't matter whether they're in the church, it doesn't matter if they're homeless, doesn't matter if they're black, doesn't matter if they're gay or uneducated, um, struggling with literacy, you know, everyone should have um, a sense that they are loved by God, but also loved by others. And that's the greatest travesty, isn't it? Perhaps when people feel that they are not loved. Yeah. And that turns anger and bitterness and understandably so. Um, but that's got to be also then met by love, which is sometimes we call it tough love. Sometimes it's not, it's, it's, it's not, love is a hard thing sometimes, quite often. Can uh, I just press you on love? I mean, uh, I suppose there might be some viewers that are thinking, well, it's all very easy to say that, you know, love will change the world. And in part it will, but in part it won't. Um, what else does the world need, do you um, estimate, um, to be changed into a better world rather than the world perhaps that we're in at the moment? I mean, uh, we had a brief conversation um, just before we started recording about uh, what happened in America yesterday. And um, the, the, the powerful um, you know, speech given, um, by Biden about, you know, even though we disagree, you know, let, let's be united. I suppose that's saying let's love one another, even though we disagree. <laughs> Is that the sort of thing that the world should be hearing? Yeah. I know. yeah. One of the things that I think that, uh, saying when you go out for dinner, you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about politics, and you don't talk about sex. So kind of the taboos. Um, and I think, I'm not sure it was Mandela or somebody like Desmond Tutu probably, who said religion and politics are inextricably bound up. You, you cannot have one without the other. You know, if, if what you believe is, we're talking about you know, love for every person, then politics is, is, we have to engage politically. That doesn't necessarily mean it's party politics, but we have to stand up for what we believe in and we have to name justice and we have injustice, um, but also we have to demonstrate it. And I think, you know, it's one thing protesting, but it's another thing turning that protest into action. And it's one thing saying, well, there shouldn't be homeless people. It's somebody else's job to sort that out. Actually, it's my job to sort that out. It's our collective. And I think going back to the America thing, that's one of the things that sort of Amanda Gorman, the, the young poet whom we were so impressed by, was saying that this is possible if we do it together. Yes. Um, we, we've just got to capture that. Um, but I think we, we do fight shy sometimes of political engagement um, in, in both positive and protesting ways. And those those are the ways that, that, that we can we can help to shape. But but I'm a firm believer in love is expressed in action. You're, known by, your, you're known by your deeds. Yes, yes. Fascinating. I, I, I can't believe that three small words can keep us going for half an hour. But that was fascinating to hear a little bit of an insight into your life, into your passions, into your faith, which is all inextricably linked. Um, I'm really grateful, Jan, for the time that you've shared with us. And thank you for being so honest and so passionate about um, a better world, a world that is shaped, yes, by our heritage, but shaped for the good so that social justice may be available for all and perhaps through the love that we extend to one another. So thanks for being in conversation with me this morning. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.